Allison, it's hard to fathom. It was a year ago that the first alert of a mysterious illness was circulating to Wuhan's hospitals. When I first went to the city, there were maybe 200 cases. Now, 12 months later, investigators still haven't been on the ground. There are lingering questions. And now a new study about antibodies from China's public health authority raises the possibility that the virus was spreading far wider in Wuhan than first reported. New data about the scale of the outbreak. China's CDC saying testing for antibodies in Wuhan revealed as many as 500,000 people may have been infected, nearly 10 times China's official tally. One year on, life in Wuhan appears strikingly normal. Streets are busy, kids are back in school, people packing bars and parties. We're standing here today very happy, she says. There's even a new exhibition in town, praising China's President Xi Jinping for defeating the virus. And a highly touted hospital built in 10 days, apparently no longer needed. This hospital has been closed for months. It's deserted now, but officials have left it here just in case of another wave of infection. A year ago, Wuhan's hospitals were alerted to cases of unexplained pneumonia, the world's first warning of the coming pandemic. The outbreak triggered a drastic 76-day lockdown. That's when I scrambled to leave the city. We have left Wuhan. <laughs> A documentary by American filmmaker Hao Wu shows what it was like then inside Wuhan's hospitals. It feels so long ago. <laughs> like the Wuhan lockdown feels so long ago. But at the same time, the images, the stories are still really present. Zhang Hai lost his father to COVID-19. Now he's one of a handful of citizens trying to sue the local government for allegedly concealing information. If I keep silent, nothing will change, he says. But China has long tried to contain criticism. This week, sentencing a video blogger who reported during the lockdown to four years in prison. Her lawyer says she did nothing cruel. She's innocent. The World Health Organization is still waiting to get outside experts to Wuhan. The purpose of the mission is to go to the uh, original um, uh, point at which human cases were detected and uh, that we fully ex expect to do that. And the seafood market at the center of it all, where Chinese officials say they found traces of the virus, is now fully hidden behind new walls that surround it. The WHO team is scheduled to travel here next month, and they'll work alongside Chinese journalists to look at anything that might explain how and where the spillover to humans happened. The lack of transparency, as well as the lack of outside involvement to this point, have left a lot of room for speculation and theories about the origins of the virus. But these answers are critical for preventing future pandemics, especially when the WHO is warning this may not be the big one. Allison. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Mars. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's start this hour with some good news, shall we? Another COVID vaccine approved today. This one in the UK. British regulators signing off on the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. US health officials think it could be approved here sometime around April, giving both of our countries several vaccination options. But Reuters reporting that some poor countries might not get any COVID shots until 2024. Vaccines offer great hope to turn the tide of the pandemic. But to protect the world, we must ensure that all people are at risk everywhere, not just in countries who can afford vaccines, are immunized. So far, more than 82 million people have tested positive for the virus worldwide. Nearly 1.8 million have died across the globe. That's according to Johns Hopkins University. Right now in Los Angeles, hospitals are having trouble getting enough oxygen for their COVID patients. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson joins me now from Martin Luther King Jr. Community Hospital in L.A. Steve, L.A. County hospital uh, officials say that uh, hospitalizations are up almost 1,000 percent since Halloween. What are you hearing from doctors? doctors and nurses there. That they are beyond completely overwhelmed, Allison. It's gotten to the point where they're almost sick of putting a brave face on it. These people are terrified. And that is not to say anything about the bravery of the men and women 
there in hospitals like this behind me because they are battling something that they have never, simply never seen before. These people are walking into COVID wards, into ICU rooms that are packed with patients, almost stacked on top of each other. They don't have enough room to do their work. So now you have a situation in which hospitals and staff people at these hospitals are scouring every room, every corner to find any available space to put patients Here at this hospital, this is MLK Community. This hospital has 131 beds. That's the the size of the facility. It has now 222 patients, and most of those are now COVID patients. So what they've done is they've converted conference rooms into patient care rooms. They've converted the gift shop into a patient care room. They've converted the chapel here into a patient care room. Just to have enough space to do their work. And then when you get into those rooms, you get into those ICUs, as we've been saying, as this crisis has started, the biggest problem is staffing. So you've got trained ICU nurses that are trying to give care to one patient one-on-one. That's the standard. And instead they have two or three or four or upwards of those numbers, patients that they have to care for. It is an untenable situation. Uh, And these people are now extremely scared about the jobs that they're walking into. We spoke to one nurse, not at this hospital, but at one that is going through much the same crisis issues. Uh, And here's what they said about just the the sheer uh, determination that they have to have to walk into these places. Listen to this. The one thing that I've seen more of now than I've ever seen in the past is a look of fear. We're scared. We don't know what we're walking into. But we do know that when we walk in, we're not going to have enough staff. We're not going to be able to give the care that I would want to give to my own family. This is now on top of the fact that every single hospital, just about every single hospital in this region is on diversion, which means they are, depending upon the condition you have, sending people away from the hospital, sending ambulances away because they simply do not have enough space. You mentioned it, but another problem is oxygen. Oxygen is essential for treating these high-risk COVID patients that have been on intubation or in the ICU for a long time, they need that. It is vital for them to breathe. And hospitals right now are having a problem with capacity because they're using so much of it. They're having a problem with transmission and distribution, and they're having a problem storing it. It has gotten so bad that some hospitals are now on what's called an internal crisis, which means they are no longer taking any ambulances. At least five in this region are now at that standard, and this is only going to get worse. Back to you, Allison. Yeah, see, that's the thing that is so hard to imagine, right? How does it get worse than this? Uh, But the CEO of of the hospital where you are says that they might need to start rationing care if things get worse. What does that scenario look like? And do they know how soon they might be at that stage? Well, you ask, how can it get worse? And if we're at rationing care, then that's just about as bad as you can get. Rationing care is essentially a wartime triage method where you have so many, you have an overwhelming number of patients that are so rapidly coming into the room that you cannot make simple decisions about who gets what treatment. So rationing care essentially allows the health department to decide at a more administrative level about looking at a patient and saying, that patient is too far gone. We think we can save this patient. So it's the distribution of care to each patient. It is almost like saying, instead of doing everything you possibly can, using every available resource to save one patient, which is the standard of care in this country, instead distributing that care, distributing those resources across to try to save as many patients as humanly possible. It is not news that anybody wants to hear, whether that's the residents or people that live here, including myself, or whether that's the nurses and doctors, especially that are in these ICUs and COVID wings doing all they can uh, amongst this incredible tide of patients. Allison? Uh, Steve, uh, we've got more bad news, too. Uh, Governor Gavin Newsom saying that California now has a case of that new COVID variant from the U.K. Uh, What else can you tell us? What do we know about that? This new, uh, apparently, possibly more contagious variant of COVID has been discovered in South Los Angeles. It to people who are healthcare workers who have been doing this for a while, uh, they had found and discovered that maybe this was here towards the beginning of the week. 
the health direct director said they had uh, done some samples and that they haven't discovered it. And then, then the news broke about today where they had discovered that new variant. I don't think it's surprising to people looking at the numbers, looking at how many people have come through these ICUs and ERs to say that there is something that may be more contagious in these communities. They said earlier that this was not the dominant variant of the strain, so it's more likely that the, the most generic version of COVID is the one that is still rippling through the community. But they aren't surprised that it's yeah. here. And the health director, the county health director, has said that no matter what, treating it and combating it is exactly the same. That goes for people at home, which means you have to stay home. And that goes for people, the nurses, the doctors in these hospitals that are doing basically all they can. And now they have to essentially do more. Allison. Steve, uh, all our, our love and thoughts and prayers and, and all the good energy in the world to all of you there in L.A. County. I look forward to the day, hopefully soon, uh, where we're checking in with you about some better news. I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well, Allison. Thank you. Stay safe, Steve. All right, let's get to Dr. Owais Durrani, an emergency medicine physician in San Antonio, Texas. Dr. Durrani, thank you so much for being with us. We just heard hospitals in L.A. warning they might not have enough oxygen for their COVID patients. How are things at your emergency room in San Antonio? Thanks for having me. Well, you know, as we kind of heard, they're tough in Texas as well. In Texas, you know, kind of I'll give you a few numbers. Pre-Thanksgiving, our positivity rate of COVID patients was 9%. Post-Thanksgiving, was 14%. Over this past week, it's been 19%. Our um, ICUs are nearing capacity. They're not there yet, but they are nearing capacity. And statewide, we have the most uh, patients hospitalized in ICUs and general hospitals, hospital beds since this pandemic began. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of emergency department, department boarding. And so that means patients that are admitted to ICUs, you know, sometimes for 12 hours, sometimes for 24 hours, stuck in the emergency department because there's no room for them to go upstairs. And that's not optimal for their care. And it puts an extra strain on the emergency department staff to take care of new critically ill patients coming in as well. We know the UK just okayed the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine today, but we don't expect it to get approval here in the U.S. until sometime around April. Why the delay? Why do you, do you, is it going to take so much longer for us to approve that vaccine here in America? Yeah, absolutely. So I think overall, it's good news. It's a generally safe and effective vaccine, but mm -hmm. there are a few questions. One of the questions is um, there weren't that many people enrolled in the studies over 65. And so just kind of looking at what the effectiveness rate is amongst that population. The other thing is it's a two-dose uh, vaccine course, much, much like the others, but they used a half dose and a full dose versus a full dose and a full dose in kind of these different patient populations. And so we don't know whether that efficacy of 70% quoted versus 90% quoted from the CEO earlier this week is going to stand once that um, kind of rollout happens. So there's a few questions. I do anticipate that it will be approved um, in the upcoming months, but it won't be any time in the, in the next few weeks or anything like that. Operation Warp Speed Chief Advisor, uh, Dr. Monsef Slawi, asking for help earlier today. Here he is. We would like to invite anybody that has energy to participate and help us further improve administration of the vaccine to come to the table, put your sleeves up and come help us with specific ideas. We know that it should be better and we're working hard to make it better. So there he is asking anyone with ideas to come to the table, help them. Uh, as someone who works in an emergency room, as someone who has seen uh, how things are going, how do you think we can improve the vaccination process? What would you most like to see? Yeah, so I think it comes down to public health infrastructure. You know, there's a saying in medicine where all breakthrough and no follow through, where, you know, in this country, we have amazing breakthroughs when it comes to medical research, but then we don't follow through in getting it to all portions of the population. And I feel like we're seeing that here. You know, initially, once this pandemic started, we had issues with testing. Um, every state was kind of for themselves. There was no federal leadership. And we're kind of starting to see that again with the vaccination process. We've um, you know, distributed millions of doses, but only 20% of those are in, in arms. And that's, you know, quite frankly, disappointing. What we need is funding for our public health infrastructure and community outreach into um, churches and community centers and kind of meeting people where they uh, live. And, you know, we need to make sure that we utilize all the doses that are out there because every dose that, you know, a patient doesn't get could be a potential infection and death down the road. 
Here in the U.S., we now have two confirmed cases of that highly contagious COVID variant out of the U.K. That first case yesterday in Colorado. We've got a second today, Governor Gavin Newsom confirming in California. Uh, what can we do to prevent this from spreading further in the U.S., or, or is it simply too late? It's never too late. And the answer is the same answer I would have given you on March 1st. Um, you know, following the basic public health measures that uh, physicians and uh, public health professionals have been, you know, saying wear a mask, avoid big, large gatherings, wash your hands and, you know, be careful. Um, you know, this virus strain is no different than the other variants that we've seen. The other thing is it's not completely unexpected. You know, the coronavirus, the family, family of viruses on average has one mutation every two weeks. Most of those are meaningless. This one happened to um, change a protein that leads to increased transmission rates by it appears 71 percent or so. And so um, thankfully, it doesn't appear to be more deadly at this point. But, you know, following the basics that we've been pushing for the past almost year now is what's going to protect us from this strain and every other strain. More than 2 million kids have tested positive for COVID-19 as of Christmas Eve. That's according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, vaccine clinical trials are happening now for kids. Do we have any sense of when they possibly uh, might be able to get vaccinated? You know, it's still going to be a while. I wouldn't expect it to be in the first half of uh, 2021. Maybe around the summer, we'll have some preliminary data and get those approvals. Um, uh, then in terms of the numbers of kids going up, I think that is to be expected as well. Um, you know, most kids were isolating at home, attending school via Zoom. Uh, for the holidays, a lot of families got together. There was a lot of travel. And so that's going to naturally lead to an increase in um, positivity rates amongst kids. But I think the main thing is, you know, focusing on isolation and focusing on the public health measures and just uh, staying healthy and living long enough to get that vaccine once it's approved for uh, kids and yeah. the rest of us as well. Uh, Dr. Durrani, I know it's been a while, but thank you so much for joining us again on NBC News Now. Uh, always wonderful to see you. Stay well, stay healthy. Good to see you as well. Thank you. U.S. prisons are a hot spot for the coronavirus, but several states are including them, excluding them rather, from their vaccine plans, ignoring guidance from the CDC. Incarcerated people here in the U.S. are four times as likely to get COVID-19, and they're twice as likely to die from it, according to a recent National Commission on COVID-19 and Criminal Justice study. NBC News' Valerie Castro is outside the Department of Corrections in Cranston, Rhode Island, one of the few states that's prioritizing correctional facility staff and inmates. Good evening, Allison. The Department of Corrections here in Rhode Island is now a week into its vaccination process. This all started last Tuesday when they began vaccinating staff members uh, here at the different facilities. About 107 of them have been vaccinated so far. That was followed up with inmates over the weekend. Incarcerated individuals began receiving the vaccine. We're told about 150 have been vaccinated so far. The Department of Corrections here says that they've identified individuals who are high risk. Not every inmate is eligible to get the vaccine vaccine at this point. Those who are high risk, perhaps 65 and older that have underlying medical conditions and may be immunocompromised. There has been some controversy around the country as far as whether inmates should be getting the vaccine at this point and considered a priority. Uh, but here in Rhode Island, they tell us that the fact is not everyone has a life sentence. These inmates uh, and incarcerated individuals will eventually be released, many of them going back into the community to be with friends and family. And so it's really a sense of a greater good, a greater safety for public health in the community as a whole. Uh, the medical director here talked more about that with us yesterday. Uh, take a listen to what he had to say. Jails and prisons were not designed to take global pandemics into consideration. I find it very important to, to protect this, this population, in part because they are part of the community. A lot of our individuals are going to be released and go out into the community. And despite high walls, despite these fences, no jail is an island. People are coming in and out, and that's, that's correctional officers, that's physicians, that's attorneys, that's social workers. So by focusing on this population, we're, we're really helping the community. And Allison, it is important to point out that the Rhode Island Department of Corrections has been hard hit by the coronavirus this year. Earlier this year, two inmates passed away. And just two weeks ago, a corrections officer also passed away just before the Christmas holiday. So again, they feel it is very important to make sure that both staff and inmates are getting the protection that they need. Allison. 
The UK has enough COVID shots for its entire population. Now that it's approved the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, the British Health Secretary Matt Hancock breaking that news on the BBC this morning. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel has more. Allison, here in London, public health officials believe that the approval today of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is going to be a game changer and dramatically speed up the vaccination process in this country and eventually across the world. The UK started about a month ago with its vaccine rollout before other Western countries uh, with the Pfizer vaccine. Until now, they have only done about 600,000 vaccinations. The program is relatively slow because the Pfizer vaccine is difficult to handle. It requires ultra cold storage. You can only move it a limited number of times. According to local laws, you can only do four logistical moves. That is from the manufacturing plant to one refrigerator to another to ultimately the nurse's office where the patient, where the uh, vaccination is given. And if you move it more than that, you have to throw it away. Once you defrost it, you have five days to use it. It comes in large bundles, uh, e each bundle of a thousand doses. Those need to be unpacked and broken up into smaller groups in an ultra cold storage facility. It is proven to be very difficult for medical professionals to handle. Some of them, and I've seen this myself, have been intimidated trying to keep track of and uh, follow the, the handling guidelines of the Pfizer vaccine. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is a more traditional type. It's called a viral vector vaccine in that it uses a, a virus, a different virus, to deliver genetic material to, to trigger an immune response. And uh, because it is a, a, of a different structure, it only needs to be kept at fridge-like temperatures, like many drugs. And that means you can, you can break it up, you can put it into small doses, you can push it out to retirement homes, to uh, medical facilities, making the, the program officials here hope much, much faster. And uh, they, they hope to uh, reach a, a level where not just the most vulnerable, not just frontline health care workers, but a much broader segment of society will be vaccinated in the not too distant future. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.